stand against us. Our God is with us. Emmanuel. All those who live in the shadow. Hebrews chapter 9, reading verses 23 through 28. If you're visiting with us and you don't have a copy of the scriptures, there's one in front of you. And if you're using a pew Bible, it's on page 1193. And if you are here visiting with us and you do not have a copy of the scriptures or have a Bible of your own, you are welcome to take the one that's in the pew in front of you, home with you, that is our gift to you. I just want to make sure you knew that. But Hebrews chapter 9, verses 23 through 28 starting in verse 23. Thus it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copy of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly, as the high priest enters the holy places every year with the blood not his own. For then he would have to have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, 
but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Would you pray with me, please? Lord, I just, as I read these verses, I am reminded of the city not made, by, not made by man's hands, a place not made by men, but by you, a perfect place. What a day it will be when we get to be in your presence. Because of what you have done, Jesus, your sacrifice, your perfect once and for all sacrifice. I pray this morning, Lord, as Pastor Jim opens your word, that you would open our hearts, that we'd be ready to receive the truth that you show us, that we are encouraged and strengthened, looking forward to the day that will come, your return, Lord Jesus, when all things will be made anew, when we will no longer see the things going on in the world that we see today, the things that weigh us down, the challenges, the frustrations this past week was filled with joy, celebrating Thanksgiving with family, others. There were challenges of mourning the loss of loved ones or the reminder of the challenges we have in our families. But we were reminded today that we serve a perfect God. We have a perfect Savior. Mm. And we have an existence waiting for us. We thank you for your sacrifice, Jesus, that once and for all, we praise you this day. Mm. In Christ's name, amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor Craig. <clears throat> I can't <clears throat> wait to watch the video uh, to hear that again, Angela. That was absolutely beautiful, and Shaney accompanying that. I appreciate that very much. It puts our hearts, I believe, at, uh, at peace uh, and yet with high expectations of God's word to be broken. So, um, Pastor Craig read to you this passage of Scripture. Uh, this will be um, the last Sunday in Hebrews. We will take a break from that, as I shared with you earlier, and we will be ad addressing different selections of Scripture, answering the question, who is Jesus? And then we'll revisit Hebrews starting the first Sunday of next year, if you can believe that. This is, without a doubt, one of those great passages in Scripture that just seems to have a bottomless pit of meaning, of biblical truth. Um, it presents Christ as the, as the perfect sacrifice for sins. We've been saying that for several weeks, of course, you know that as we've been building up uh, uh, with uh, Hebrews, with the uh, previous uh, uh, chapters. We know that he is the only one who can save us. That is Jesus the Christ. And he's the only one that can complete our salvation, which I'll cover more in my last point here this morning. The completion of our salvation, that's uh, laying there now before you. You're wondering, what does he mean by that? Well, remember that our, our Hebrew author is inspired by the Spirit of God, so he is the one that's uh, writing this through his personality, and he's making the case that every uh, thing that the, that the Hebrews, um, you would also know them as the Israelites, uh, we would also know them as the Jews, they're all the same, that's all synonymous with the same group of people. The author was making his case uh, to them about their experiences, if you'll remember, of the tent of the meeting or the tabernacle in the wilderness, that, that it was just a type, a type of foreshadowing of the one who would be superior to all the sacrificial rituals presented by their priests and even the high priest, and that would be Jesus the Christ, the perfect the perfect sacrifice for sins, and, and all planned before the foundation of the world by the love of our Heavenly Father for man. Oswald Chambers says this in a, a devotional that I use daily, my utmost for his highest. If you haven't, if you're not familiar with that, I encourage you to be familiar with that. It's a great way to start your day. And Chambers says this, the death of of Jesus Christ is the performance in history of the very mind of God. 
There's no room for looking on Jesus Christ as a martyr. His death was not something that happened to him which might have been prevented. His death was the very reason that he came. He came to save man from his sins. And he will return a second time, as you can see, that's the title of this message in your worship guide. He will return a second time to complete man's salvation by bringing all of his spiritual brothers and sisters to himself to be with him in all of eternity. I love the passage of Scripture that you're going to see on the screen behind me, John 14, verses 1 through 6. If you're not familiar with this verse, get familiar with it. It will encourage your heart. Read it often. Jesus is talking. He's the spokesperson. And he is saying to his audience, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms, the King James Version says, mansions. If it were not so, Jesus said, I would have told you that I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. And I'll take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And then Jesus said, to Thomas and to the other disciples, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. I want to spend most of my time this morning in verses 27 and 28, I'll do, although I do have a brief summary of verses 20 through, through 26. We'll We'll not avoid them, but I want to focus on 27 and 28 in a few moments. And you'll see uh, soon that in your worship guide that the key word in all four of my points this morning is the word prepare, prepare. That's what you'll see. Verses 23 and 24, Jesus has prepared heaven. He's prepared heaven. Thus, it was necessary. Why the word thus? Because in verse 22, it says, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. Remember, that's our transformation verse for November. And because there's no forgiveness of sin, or there's no forgiveness of sins without the shedding of blood, thus it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these for Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Christ purified everything in heaven. Think of that. It was absolutely necessary that the earthly sanctuaries and the worship rituals be purified with blood. That's what we've been studying these past several weeks. But that, that was copies of the heavenly things. I've said this repeatedly. What we are seeing if, as we read and what the Hebrew writer was teaching is that the tabernacle and the things in the tabernacle, the rituals in the tabernacle, were but copies of the heavenly things, the reality. And thus it was necessary that the heavenly sanctuary and worship be purified with the blood of the better, no, the perfect sacrifice, which is Jesus. Why? I would think you would be asking, why does anything in heaven need to be cleansed and purified? What a strange thing to say, Pastor. Well, I'll remind you again. Remember, the type sacrifice of the high priest was all about him preparing himself by the slaughter of animals and the shedding of blood that he could be in the presence of God behind the veil. 
and so that he could be the mediator between God and man and man and God. So the way into heaven had to be covered with blood in order for man to approach God. Now stay with me. Let's, let's jump ahead just a few verses and put this kind of together, and then I'm going to come back to them later. But again, pick, pick up with me at verse 24 again. For Christ has entered, not into the holy places made with hands, not in the tabernacle, not in the tent of meeting. They are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, where the reality is at, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself up repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy places every year with the blood not his own. He had to sacrifice animals, but he did that over and over and over, as we've said before, Jesus only once. Verse 26, for then he would have to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages, to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. The sacrificial blood, then, of Christ paved the way for the believer to be in God's presence now and in heaven. Just as the mercy seat in the earthly tabernacle was covered with the blood of the chosen goat by the high priest, he then would enter into God's presence at the mercy seat. Jesus offered his blood and became the mercy seat in the heavenly tabernacle. That is, the blood satisfied God's wrath. The shedding of Jesus' blood satisfied God's wrath. The shedding of Jesus' blood satisfied God's judgment. So we, now and for eternity, can be in the presence of God. An old-time Bible teacher and scholar, you may know the name, J. Vernon McGee, said it this way. As we approach the teaching of the mercy seat in its primary import, it's, in, it's essential to see what made it a mercy seat. In order to ascertain this, a consideration must be made of the great day of atonement. Remember, that's the day of atonement was every year. For on this day did the high priest approach the mercy seat. At the time of the great Yom Kippur, Aaron, he's the first high priest, after casting lots for the scapegoat, offered the other on the burnt altar. And offering a bull for himself, for he had sin in his life as a high priest, but he had to offer sacrifice so that he could be in the presence of God to offer a sacrifice for the Israelites. So after offering a sacrifice for himself, an analogy which finds no parallel in Christ because Jesus did not need to sacrifice for himself, he indeed was sinless, Aaron then brought the basin of blood within the veil and sprinkled it on the mercy seat, remember? The blood made it a mercy seat. That's key. God did not look down upon the merit of Aaron or upon the goodness of the people, but he saw the blood. The sinning nation was made nigh by the blood. Christ is in the mercy seat today. And he quotes Romans 3.25, Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood, meaning he satisfied God's wrath, that's propitiation, to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, forbearance he had passed over former sins. So McGee continues, the word translated propitiation is in the Greek the same word for the mercy seat, kapore. Christ is the mercy seat today for the world. Christ is the mercy seat today for the world. 
In Hebrews 9, McGee says in the passages that I'm covering this morning, Christ is seen as the sacrifice which taketh away the sin of the world. That ends this quote. But this is the reason Christ appeared in the presence of God for us. That's what the writer is saying. He cleansed and purified the way for us. Now, did he actually take his physical blood to heaven? I've been asked that before. I don't believe there's enough evidence in the scripture to make this an absolute. I don't believe so. But we can say this unequivocally, that the picture or the type of the Levitical sacrificial process points to the spiritual reality of Christ entering heaven and appearing in the presence of God on our behalf, symbolically, with his blood. 1 John 1, 7, behind me. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, does what? Cleanses us from all sin. So, Jesus prepared a perfect sacrifice, point number two. In verses 25 and 26, Christ does not offer a repeated sacrifice. That's what it says. He sacrificed himself once. The earthly high priest had to make sacrifices often. I've said this previously. He had to enter into the Holy of Holies every year to make sacrifices for sin. He was, as all men, sinful. He could never make the perfect sacrifice, but Christ could. He was perfect. He was God himself in flesh, 100% God, 100% man. He is the perfect high priest, as we've said before, who would sacrifice himself for the sins of men. How many times? Once. And how long did it stay? Forever, forever. Verse 26 says he has put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. He's put it away. It's never to be brought up again if your faith and your trust is in Christ. John MacArthur says it this way, here is the whole summary of Hebrews in one sentence. Ours is the high priest of high priests. And he is seated, a reference to Jesus. His work is done, completely finished for all time and for us. So in verse 27, we finally get there. I want you to know that Jesus prepared a spiritual life. Maybe even more accurately for this point, it should say Jesus prepared spiritual life. Let me explain. Look at first verse 27 again. And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. I want, you to, I want you to note four significant points in that verse alone, in that verse alone. Here's the first one. It stands out like the red-nosed reindeer, Rudolph. And it stands out clearly. Man dies he dies once, only one time. That's pretty clear. There's no second chance. That's the emphasis of once, by the way. The emphasis of once puts an emphasis on who we are this side of heaven now. Man has only one chance to be forgiven. Man has only one chance to be saved, redeemed, only, only one chance to become acceptable to God and receive the inheritance of His promise, which is eternal life. Man dies, and when he dies, that opportunity is over. Christ died in this world and in the time frame of His life in this world. He did not die in some other world. He did not die in some other time frame of some other world. He died in this world, 
once. Jesus Christ, by the way, the second person in the Godhead of three, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Jesus died on earth as a man for man. That's clear. There'll never, ever be another chance to be covered by his sacrifice other than in this world and in this life. Men and women will die and will die once, individually, never again to live on this earth. I shared with this congregation, maybe not this one sitting here now, but years ago I heard there was an insurance company who did the um, mortality rate. That's how they set uh, the cost of insurances to determine in what age people die most and all that kind of thing. And then they set the rates for the insurance that you buy. And they paid millions of dollars for this study. And they came out of it that there was a 100% death rate. <laughs> Men and women will die. They'll die once. The psalmist knew that. Look at Psalm 89, 48. It says, what man can live and never see death? Who can deliver his soul from the power of Sheol, which is a word for grave, death? Man can live and never see death? It's impossible. So who's going to deliver his soul from the power of death? We'll have the answer to that, don't we? This writer says in the scriptures, he said, man dies and then, and then comes judgment. That's what it says. I'm not making this up. It says that. Man sinned and cursed against God, ignored and neglected God, rebelled and rejected God. We, we, just, we just tend to live the way we want to live without any factor about God. We go our own way and we do our own thing instead of living like God tells us. And why wouldn't we? Because Isaiah prophesied that we would. He said, we like sheep have gone astray, each to our own way. So we just live out the way that the scriptures say that we will. Verse 27 tells us clearly, just as clear as it can ever be stated, it says it's appointed for man to die, how many times? Once. And after that comes judgment. So once man dies without Christ, he's separated and he's cut off from God forever. He's He's never allowed to be in God's presence ever, ever, ever. He will be forbidden to enter into heaven and, and cast into the place, that, into the very opposite of heaven, which is a place called hell. It's not preached enough behind the pulpits in America. Amen. Judgment follows death. That's what it says. Man will be judged and separated from God. That's the basic meaning of death, by the way, separation. Death never means extinction. It never means annihilation. It never means non-existence. Death is the separation of a person from the purpose or use for which he was intended. I quote that from an author that I do not know. Death is the separation of a person from the purpose or use for which he was intended. The Bible speaks of three deaths. I think we need to take the time this morning just to review that again. Because as a body of Christ, if that's who you are, we need to be encouraged this morning. I prayed for you to be encouraged this morning with this message. If you do not know Christ, please pay particular attention. There's three types of death. The first is a physical death. That's the separation of man's spirit from the body. The gift of breath 
is stopped, I pray every morning, every morning, God as my, as my judge, thanking him for the breath that I take. It is a gift from God. Because you see, when a person ceases to breathe, he ceases to exist on this earth, and then he's buried. Paul knew that in 1 Corinthians 15, 22, it says, For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. So there's a physical death. We inherited that from our earthly father, Adam. There's a spiritual death. That's the second death, spiritual death. What's the spiritual death? Well, that's the separation of man's spirit from God while he's still living, while he's still walking on earth. Man is spiritually dead on earth without Christ. You cannot be in the presence of God if you have not received the supreme sacrifice of Christ for your sins. You, as I would be, and was at one time, spiritually dead. Man is seen as still in his sins, and he's dead to God. He said to be dead to the Lord Jesus Christ and to God and to spiritual matters. Spiritual truths, the Bible said, are nothing but foolishness to that person. Ephesians 2.1, another one that's very, very plain. It's not hard to explain this. And you were dead. There it is. You were dead in the trespasses and sins. He's not talking about a physical death. He's writing, Paul's writing to people that are alive. And he's telling them, you're dead in your trespasses and your sins. So while you're walking physically on this earth, Paul says you are spiritually dead to God. I would think you would want to ask, what does that look like? Well, here it is. Here's what somebody spiritually dead looks like. He's a person who wastes his life in ungodly or unrighteous living. That person's spiritually dead. A person who lives in habitual sin is spiritually dead. A person who lives and is devoted to the sinful pleasures of this world is spiritually dead. A person who has not repented of that sin and placed their trust in Christ alone is spiritually dead. So a person who does not have the Son of God, Jesus the Christ, in his physical life or her physical life, according to the Scriptures, is spiritually dead. So while he or she physically walks this side of heaven without Christ in their lives, they're spiritually dead in their trespasses and in their sins. So there's a physical death, there's a spiritual death, and then third, there's an eternal death. There's three. What's an eternal death? Well, the eternal death is kind of like what you're hearing. It's an event that takes place, and it's for eternity. The separation of man from God's presence forever. That's the second death that Revelation speaks about. It's an eternal state of being dead to God. Eternal state. It's forever. It's a spiritual death separated from God that's prolonged beyond the death of the body. It's called the second death or the eternal death at judgment and again cast in a place called hell. We hear this. We may even speak this. But we should be weeping over this. Second Thessalonians, Paul said, they, will, they who is they, the spiritually dead. The spiritually dead will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction 
away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. Again, very plain. Very plain. The fourth significant point is this, though. The glorious news about judgment to the believer. I told you, I want you to be encouraged. I've laid out to you what the scriptures teach about dying physically one time, about being dead spiritually without Christ, about being cast in a place called hell for eternity, forever separated from God. But to you, the believer, we have great news, don't we? The glorious news about judgment to the believer. Christ, Christ was offered up once to bear the sins and the judgment of those who will believe. Christ, Jesus the Christ, took our sins on himself and took our judgment on himself. And if we believe, truly trusting in Jesus Christ to bear our sins and our judgment, then God counts our sins as having been laid on him as well as our judgment. Therefore, the scriptures say, therefore, the believer will not be judged. There will be no condemnation for sin. And Paul knew the exactness of that when he said in Romans 8, 1, there is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. That should get an amen. But take note. This amazing salvation is not a universal salvation. Individually, individually, a person has to believe and trust in this supreme sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Listen to the logic of this. If a person does not believe in something, if he doesn't trust it, how in the world would it ever work for him or her? It won't. But when we believe, really believe, then the sacrifice of Jesus Christ covers our sins and we become acceptable to God. And that person need not fear death. Charles Spurgeon said it this way. The Christian, who's the Christian? Not someone that just calls himself a Christian. That's not a Christian. That's just a label. We probably should say the Christ-centered person who contemplates death with joy is a living sermon. That's what Spurgeon says. Does that mean that we look forward to death? It does not. Although I have people in my life right now that I'm ministering to that they wish that they would stop breathing. Their bed of suffering has become immense. And they cry out to God, cease the breathing so I can be in your presence forever. And so they stare at death with joy. And they are a living sermon to me when I visit them. Peter wrote this, 1 Peter 3, for Christ also suffered, how many times? Once for sins. The righteous, that would be Jesus. For the unrighteous, that would be you and me. That he might bring us as believers to God. Being put to death in the flesh, that's Jesus. And made alive in the spirit. You do know that. He arose from the grave. You do know that. And that brings us to verse 28. How powerful is this? So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear, will appear a second, I can't even say it without breaking out in a smile, will appear a second time, but not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Jesus is prepared to return. He'll return to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Now you have to answer that question. 
Are you eagerly awaiting for the return of Jesus Christ? Or are you satisfied with the way the world's going right now? Are you happy in all the horror that we witness and read about every day? Or are you like me, You want this madness to stop. You want this madness to stop. And if you're like me, you know the only way it's ever going to stop is if he'll return. And so Jesus will return to save those who eagerly wait for him, to wait expectantly. That's what that means. To anxiously be expecting that to happen today. Is that on your heart? What a phenomenal statement that is. What an unbelievable sight that it will be. Christ, the, the, the Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, he will break through the sky above and he's going to return to save all of those who are expectantly looking for for him. It completes our salvation. We can rest assured that he's not returning to deal with sin. That's what the writer said. Not this time. This time he comes to complete the salvation of those who eagerly wait to see him. That's why Paul, when he wrote Romans 8, it's not behind me. Listen to this very carefully. Romans 8, 28. Some of you may be very familiar with this. It says this, of the, and those whom he predestined, he also called. That means God knows who's coming to salvation. By the way, he's omniscient. He better know. He's God. He knows who's coming in faith to be in the bride of Christ. He knows. He calls them out of this world. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. And if you will look that up, you will see that it's all in past tense. It's all in past tense. It means you've been called out of the world, you have your salvation, you've been justified. A legal term means you've been set free from the bondage of sin, and you have been glorified. It means that you are in the presence of God in all of His glory. That's where you're at now physically. If we were going to try to summarize this, it would kind of be like this. The bodies of dead believers, those who died, yet they were looking for his return, but they passed away and they're now in the grave. The scriptures are clear that they'll be resurrected from that grave one day. They'll be resurrected from that grave to meet him in the sky. And the Bible says the persons who are living now and eagerly looking for him and expecting him, they're going to be lifted up off this earth and they'll ascend up to join them and him in the sky. It's going to be a heavenly reunion. That's what it says. You say, Pastor, where in the world did you get that fantasy from? Well, it's not fantasy. Paul wrote about it in Thessalonians. He said, here it goes. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel and the sound of the trumpet of God. And here it is. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. And surely that's got to get an amen. So Spurgeon offers this challenge, and I close with this. Spurgeon says, he says, if I were asked to visit you tomorrow evening, I'm sure you would make some preparations for my call. Even for one so commonplace as himself, you would prepare because you want to welcome me. If you expected the queen to call, he was from England, how excited you would be, what preparation good housewives would make for a royal visitor. When we expect our Lord to come, we shall be concerned to have everything ready for him. 
He says, I sometimes see the great gates open in front of the larger houses in the suburbs, and it means that they're expecting company. Keep the great gates of your souls always open, expecting your Lord to come. And so I leave you with this thought. 1 John 2, verse 28. And now, little children, that would be you if you're in Christ. He's writing, John's writing, he's writing to his little children, his church. He calls them little children. Most of you are like that to me. I stand before you as an old man. Many of you even know me as like a grandfather. I'm okay with that. Maybe not great-grandfather, but grandfather's okay. But my little children, abide in him, rest in him, that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. You see, according to what I read, Jesus will return. A second time. Hmm. Father, that is so great. <laughs> it is so great. To even go through the rest of our day, who knows what we're going to hear in the news today, what madness might happen in a, a Walmart or a Tim Hortons or target wherever someone might be today, what madness might happen, how life can just stop so suddenly. People left to go shopping, families waiting for their return, and they never return. Madness. Madness. Choices being made to Alter the physical body from how you've created man and women to be. To go through the scars of, of the hurt and the pain of that. Touches lives right in this congregation. Madness. Madness. And God, you're the only one that can calm the storm. You're the only one that can bring a peace that surpasses all understanding. You're the only one that we can take refuge in. For the world has gone mad. God, we need to be able to leave this your sanctuary on this first Advent Sunday. We need to leave with hearts encouraged. Father, how can we do that when we stare at this madness every day? How can we do that? Well, I believe your scriptures tell us to do this. We're to place our faith and our trust in Christ, that he paid for my sins and the sins of those that are listening to me this morning or watching this on a video. He died for them, died for me. We trust in that. And so I can leave this sanctuary with the peace that surpasses all understanding, knowing that if I were to be hit by a car on my way home, my last breath on this earth is my first breath in your presence. And for that, I'm encouraged. And God, I pray that for every man, woman, and young person in this congregation, whatever they're dealing with, whatever, however pain, whatever the depths of it is, would you encourage them, God, that there is a day, may not be today, but if so, praise your name, but there will be a day that the, the heavens will split. And Jesus Christ will bring his bride into the heavens. And we will be at peace for eternity in your presence. So God, encourage hearts this morning. May your presence overwhelm us and take us into our, our neighborhoods, the grocery store our colleges, the school, the workplace. May we go with our hearts full of joy, with high expectation. There is a day Jesus will return. In his name I pray. 
God's people said. Amen. Bye.